order. I call this meeting to order. Thank you, Judy. This is the Standing Committee on Health. My name is Kent Smith. I am the MLA for the Eastern Shore. I'm the vice chair of this committee, but I got a promotion today. Today, we'll be hearing from the Department of Health and Wellness, the Nova Scotia Health Authority, Dalhousie University's Political Science Department, and School of Health and Human Performance regarding funding for public health in Nova Scotia. I would ask everyone to please put their phones on silent. Uh, I would also now like to start by asking all the members of the committee to introduce themselves, beginning with MLA Sheehy Richard. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Melissa Sheehy Richard, the MLA for Hans West. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I'm Chris Palmer, MLA for Kings West. Good morning. I'm John White, the MLA for Glace Bain Dominion. Good morning. I'm Danielle Barcos, MLA for Chester St. Margaret's, and thank you all for being here and our live studio audience. <laughs> Good morning. Susan LeBlanc, the MLA for Dartmouth North. Hi, Gary Burrell, Halifax Shabakto. Good morning and welcome. Rafa Di Costanzo, MLA for Clayton Park West. Good morning, everyone. Brendan McGuire, Halifax Atlantic. Great to see you all. Thank you very much to the members. For the purpose of Hansard, I also recognize the president's presence of Legislative Council, Mr. Gordon Hebb, and Legislative Committee Clerk, Ms. Judy Cavanaugh. Uh, at this point in time, I'd like to officially welcome the witnesses for joining us today. I'm going to give everyone the opportunity to first introduce themselves just for the purpose of the record. Once everyone's introduced themselves, then you'll have the opportunity to offer any opening remarks if you have any. So we'll begin with Dr. Kirk, please. My name is Dr. Sarah Kirk, and I'm a professor at the School of Health and Human Performance at, the da at Dalhousie University. Good morning, everyone. I'm Marcia DeSantis. I'm the Senior Director for Population and Public Health with the Health Authority. And good morning. I'm uh, Kathleen Trott, Associate Deputy Minister at the Department of Health and Wellness with responsibility for public health. Dr. Robert Strang, Chief Medical, Medical Officer of Health in the Department of Health and Wellness. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jennifer Heatley. I'm the Executive Director of Public Health at the Department of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much to the witnesses. I believe at least one or two of you have opening remarks. Doc Dr. Oh, apologies. Dr. Furlbeck. Hi, uh, Dr. Catherine Furlbeck, Chair of the Department of Political Science at Dalhousie University. Thank you very much. And if I miss you in the future, I'll, I'll try to avoid that as much as possible. Uh, Dr. Strang, I believe you have opening remarks. I do. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Chair and fellow committee members for having us here today. Uh, before we turn things over for questions, I'd like to provide a brief overview of public health and public health funding in Nova Scotia. Oh, no, never mind. Uh, it will be important to distinguish between public health and the public's health in this discussion. So public health is the formal part of the healthcare system that focuses on maintaining or improving the collective health of communities or populations as opposed to providing individual care. The core functions of public health are population health assessment and surveillance, chronic disease and injury prevention, health promotion, health protection, environmental health, and in Nova Scotia, the responsibility for the function of environmental health is with the Department of Environment and Climate Change, and emergency preparedness. Public health works in these areas primarily through multi-partner collaboration and community mobilization and engagement, often with the role of providing epidemiology and evidence of effective interventions. The issues affecting the public's health are complex, interconnected, and multi-sectoral. There is not one single government department or agency that solely addresses the public's health. To be effective in this work, public health, what I call big PH public health, needs to be structured so that the core functions are integrated, that we have an adequate and appropriately trained workforce and be positioned to work and lead where appropriate across departments and sectors. Doing so will allow us to effectively influence the overall health of Nova Scotians and the communities that they live, work, and learn in. 
Since I began working in Nova Scotia in 1999, there have been two times of significant investment in public health. In the mid-2000s, after a comprehensive review of public health, there was a, a substantial restructuring and growth of public health, what I call Public Health Renewal 1.0. Currently, we are in year two of a three-year fiscal investment in public health, along with significant restructuring to create a provincial public health system. And that's what I call Public Health Renewal 2.0. There have been investments at the Department of Health and Wellness, mostly in surveillance, medical officers of health, and emergency uh, preparedness capacity. And my colleague, Ms. DeSantis, will provide an overview of uh, investments that have also happened in Nova Scotia Health, public health. So as we move forward, I see opportunities for public health to contribute to advancing issues that impact the health of Nova Scotian communities and populations. And ADM Trot will have more to say on this. I would also like to touch on the delivery of some public health programs. There's a notion that all public health programs should be universal, but, that is not, but it's not about having equal access for everybody to these programs. It's about ensuring there is equity. In other words, there are uh, families and parts of our communities that need more supports than others. So public health focus on, focuses from an equity perspective, not an, not an equal perspective. There are social determinants of health that influence health outcomes, and by having targeted programs, services, and resources, we are able to optimize the health of those who are marginalized and vulnerable. So in closing, while we will always need to ensure that public health has the necessary structure and capacity, our primary focus should not be on this or a specific budget target, but ensuring that we have sufficient collective attention and investment in the issues that optimize the health for, of all Nova Scotians. Thank you, and I'll turn it now to ADM Trot. Ms. Trot. Thank you. So good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to meet with you today. On behalf of Dr. Strang and myself, we're pleased to be here in attendance with Jennifer Heatley, Executive Director of Public Health, and representatives from the Nova Scotia Health Authority and Dalhousie University to answer your questions on funding for public health in Nova Scotia. Each witness brings something different to the table, unique perspectives and ideas on public health and how we can address some of the challenges our communities and Nova Scotians are facing. Last spring, we released Action for Health, a four-year plan to improve the health system. This strategic plan is divided into six key solutions that will transform our healthcare system. The work has certainly begun, but one of the key solutions is focused on the factors affecting health and well-being. This is critical to the sustainability of the health system, something that can't be done overnight and not one that can be done alone. The last few years have clearly shown what we can accomplish when we work together. The partnerships we've developed extend beyond those directly involved in healthcare and have been key in our response to COVID-19. The pandemic has highlighted our ability to quickly mobilize the resources we need to work towards a common goal. The same approach will serve us well in our continuation of delivering public health programming and services. We are committed to continued collaboration with our partners to maximize opportunities to strengthen the delivery and accessibility of public health for those who need it most. We have a lot of work ahead of us, but this work is critical and public health has an important role in the transformation. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today about our work in public health and look forward to answering your questions this morning. Thank you, Ms. Trott. If you don't mind just moving your microphone over a little bit closer to yourself, that would be great. Thank you so much. Ms. DeSantis, I believe you have opening remarks as well. I do. Uh, similar to my colleagues, I would like to thank you, Mr. Chair and fellow committee members for having us here today. Dr. Strang and ADM Trott have provided an overview of public health and public health funding. Dr. Strang shared the core functions that we employ to achieve improved health of our Nova Scotian communities. Nova Scotia Health Public Health is organized to deliver on the Health Protection Act as well as other public health protocols and standards developed by the Department of Health and Wellness. We employ a variety of public health professionals to work with partners and across sectors and services to achieve these core functions. We provide an array of programs and services that focus primarily on creating supportive environments where Nova Scotians can make the healthy choice the default choice where they live, learn, work, and play. 
We also provide some individual supports and services for those who experience inequities to make health achievable for all. The focus of the program is across four distinct areas, which include health protection, early years, healthy communities, and public health sciences. Dr. Strang mentioned that we are in year two of a year or a three-year investment in public health. During the early months of the COVID pandemic, an urgent need for an additional investments in public health were identified to stabilize and strengthen our workforce relative to our core functions. Year one saw increases primarily related to our health protection core functions. This, along with interim COVID funding, has provided us with the resources to respond effectively to the COVID pandemic. Year two has provided us the ability to expand some capacity in other areas such as early years and healthy communities. Throughout the pandemic, our public health staff, along with staff from across the health system and beyond, were deployed to support our COVID response that shifted in its model to meet the ever-changing demands. We were adaptable and responsive. During this time, public health suspended all but our core critical functions, such as infectious disease case management and our immunization services. Our COVID work continues, including investigating cases and outbreaks of COVID-19 in higher risk populations, such as those living in congregate settings or from equity groups, such as our First Nations populations. In addition, we continue to support the COVID vaccination efforts, both through distribution of the vaccine to pharmacies and also through our outreach immunization clinics. Finally, we continue to support testing through our public health mobile units and the community distribution of rapid antigen tests. This is new and ongoing work for us compared to pre-pandemic. Most public public health staff have recently returned to their pre-COVID core public health functions and we are in the process of restarting our suspended services. We can do this by relying on the temporary staff supported through interim COVID-19 funding. The enhanced funding in public health has also allowed us to expand our core public health programs and services and the interim COVID funding has allowed us to respond to COVID. In closing, I would like to publicly commend our team at public health. Over the past almost three years, the staff have shown strength, resilience, and sheer determination to help keep Nova Scotians safe and healthy. They have far proven their value to the health of our population. Investing in public health is an investment in them and an investment in the future of the health of our Nova Scotians. At this time, I will pass it back to the chair. Thank you, Mr. Santis. Dr. Kirk or Dr. F uh, Ferlbeck, do you have opening remarks? Dr. Dr. Kirk. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today about public health funding in Nova Scotia. The timing of this meeting could not be better. I see an opportunity for change, and I'm encouraged by the focus on the broader health system, not just on our sickness care system. The introduction to Nova Scotia's Action for Health plan acknowledges that there is no shortage of challenges facing our health system, that these challenges require monumental action and investment, and that action is needed on the factors that affect the health and well-being of Nova Scotians each and every day. Indeed, my research is focused on understanding and looking for ways to, to design supportive environments that keep our population healthy in settings like our schools and our communities. The immediate challenges facing our health system include a growing population with higher rates of chronic disease, things like cancer and heart disease, and lower life expectancy than our Canadian counterparts. Nova Scotia also has an ageing population that is more likely to live with one or more chronic diseases. For example, they may have heart disease or cancer and arthritis. Living with more than one chronic disease is linked to social deprivation. And people who experience social deprivation are more likely to live with one or more chronic disease. We're also seeing chronic diseases develop at a younger age, which further increases pressure on our healthcare system. As my colleagues have already noted, it is important to recognise that many of the factors that influence the health of Nova Scotians lie outside the domain of the health system. Poverty, systemic racism or discrimination, and precarious housing all impact health, but have their roots in economic or social policies. 
These are the upstream social and structural determinants of health that shape the underlying conditions for, the in, for our individual abilities to adopt health-promoting behaviours. They also disproportionately impact some communities more than others. I would expect you know this already. I suspect when you work with and hear from your constituents that you are well aware of the conditions that they are, living, they are experiencing and how those conditions profoundly affect whether they are able to live a healthy life. Living in poverty or experiencing racism and discrimination or precarious housing is understandably stressful and chronic stress itself increases the risk of things like heart disease or stroke, which as I've already mentioned, are higher in Nova Scotia than the national average. It is all connected. As we heard yesterday from Minister Thompson at the government's press conference, we can't keep fixing gaps in the healthcare system when they appear. Instead, we need to invest in working together to shape a healthier society in Nova Scotia. And this means investing in a resilient and robust public health system. But it also means fixing the conditions that contribute to the poor health status of many Nova Scotians. To do any less is a disservice to our population. We must also ensure that every government department understands their integral role and their duty in enhancing the health and well-being of every adult and child in this province. Health and well-being are shaped more by the places and spaces where we spend our time than by the individual choices that we make. We must better promote health in the places where Nova Scotians live, learn, play and work, as has already been said. Any delay in these actions for health is a delay too long. We're at a critical juncture in our health system evolution. Creating the conditions to improve the health of the province must be a long-term goal, and that means a commitment and required investments beyond the life of one government and across multiple sectors and settings. Because inadequate funding for public health is a false economy. Research has just demonstrated a return on investment of public health interventions of around 14 to 1. This means that for every $1 invested in public health interventions, another $14 will subsequently be returned to the wider health and social care economy. Evidence like this clearly demonstrates that prevention is better than cure. Given the importance of public health approaches to disease prevention and addressing health inequities, and this impressive return on investment, there is a financial as well as a moral imperative for governments to increase their investments in promoting health and well-being across the life course. So what I'm saying to you today is not new or novel. We've actually known this for years, but knowing and doing are not the same thing. The solutions to improved health and well-being exist, but we need to act on them consistently and resource them adequately. With such clear link between health and wealth, a healthy population means a productive and prosperous population, and that benefits us all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kirk. Dr. Furlbeck, do you have any opening comments? Yes. Dr. Thank Furlbeck. you. Good morning. Uh, so for a few years now, we've been addressing health care within a context of crisis. But despite all the immediate challenges that we have to address right here and right now, and I know that there are a lot, it's nonetheless important not to normalize health care and public health specifically only as a form of crisis response. There's a side to public health that, especially in the present context, is much less dramatic. And that side of public health is all about its responsibility to monitor the population as a whole, to observe, to analyze, to collect, to interpret data, to prevent and remedy and mitigate problems before they balloon into bigger issues. Now, we've had to focus so rigidly on all the downstream flyers that we are perhaps in jeopardy of losing sight of the upstream causes that don't have pathogenic components. Now, the focus today is on public health funding in particular, and it's useful to look at the CHI-HI data on this point. Now, obviously, COVID has meant that public health spending everywhere has gone up tremendously to meet the crisis. But again, I want to focus on the less dramatic side of public health, the day-to-day the -day things that public health used to do before the pandemic hit. How well was public health in Nova Scotia supported in its day-to-day -day functioning before the pandemic? Well, just, just before COVID, for example, New Brunswick was spending about 4.5% of its healthcare budget on public health. Alberta and Ontario are around 7%, Saskatchewan around 9%, and Nova Scotia spent 1.5%. Now, 
uh, if you want to look at this on a per capita basis, New Brunswick was spending about $200 per person per year, Ontario about $350, uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta around $400, and Nova Scotia $80. Now, public health in Nova Scotia enjoyed a, a notable increase of up to 4% of government health expenditure for a few years, as Dr. Strang noted, following the 2006 public health review. But that went down dramatically again. And before the pandemic, we were right back to where we were in 2004 at 1.5%. Now, the pandemic meant that this funding expanded dramatically. But we also know from historical experience that when the immediate danger recedes, so too does interest in public health funding. So there is an issue of overall public health funding. But I do also want to make the point that our focus shouldn't simply be about the level of funding. It's also about how this money is used, how public health services are organized, how, part how partnerships are built and nurtured, whether there is accountability in following through and program implementation, how programs are measured and monitored, and how accessible all this information is. There's really no point in trying to run health promotion strategies, for example, devoid of data, information on why the program was needed, where it's needed the most, how well it's doing and why. The population health surveillance function that, forgive me, the somewhat more boring side of public health actually serves as the eyes and the ears of the health of the population as a whole. By having the resources to understand and monitor the health of the body politic, we know where most efficiently to address any, any inflammation before it ruptures. And without such information, we're, we're simply flying blind. And starving public health, as my colleague Dr. Kirk has already noted, is in the end a false economy. Investment in public health is precisely that, an investment. The returns may not be immediate. And I appreciate that this may perhaps be the very worst day in years to be talking about funding public health rather than things like emergency services. But as we've learned in Nova Scotia, it's pay now or pay later. We, we build hospitals knowing that there is an upfront cost. And if we don't want to be treating patients in yurts, we know that it's something that we have to do. And public health infrastructure is no different. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Furlbeck, and thank you to all the witnesses for their opening comments. Uh, I will note that there is, I'm sensing some displeasure with the length of time it's taken to do the opening remarks, and I will say that uh, we offer each witness about three minutes to do their opening remarks. We have six witnesses today. That would take us to 1024. We're at 1022, so I think we're perfectly on time. Uh, the next section of this is the question and answer period. Uh, each caucus is permitted 20 minutes to ask questions. After that, we gauge how much time we have left and then we break it down to sometimes less than 10 minutes for each caucus. We will begin the question and answer session with the Liberal Caucus. MLA McGuire. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate everyone being here today. And so I'll start out by saying that we are a university town. We have a lot of uh, students that come to this city uh, to seek higher education. Um, <clears throat> in 2021, uh, we, we heard the devastating story of Kay, Kai Matthews. Uh, who died in meningitis B in uh, in June, and recently Dalhousie student passed away, and and now uh, there's a suspected case of meningitis B at St. Mary's University um, of a student who passed away, and and I would say one preventable death is too many, and and Kai's father Nori is here today, um, and he's been advocating strong and hard for meningitis B vaccines. Uh, we do know that uh, to get a vaccine, a meningitis. B vaccine, it's about $300, if not more, depending on, uh, and that is a cost barrier. That's the reason why some people are not getting it. Um, we, we saw uh, the importance of vaccines and the rollout of vaccines during COVID-19 and the response that it had here in Nova Scotia and the deaths that it prevented and the illnesses that it prevented. Um, why is our province not covered the meningitis B vaccine? Whoever wants to take it. Dr. Strang. 
Thank you for the question. And so I think I need to go on a little bit of the science of meningococcal disease and, and meningococcal vaccines, so bear with me. So we know, first of all, there's several different strains of, of meningitis, uh, meningococcal disease, um, and we cover some of those with vaccines. Uh, we have a uh, at infancy, um, infants get a vaccine against meningococcal C. There aren't vaccines for infants for the other vac for the other uh, viruses. Uh, sorry, the other back other strains. Uh, uh, grade seven immunization. Uh, everybody's offered um, a quadrivalent vaccine against A, C, Y, and and W strains. There is not a va that that quadrivalent vaccine does not include uh, B. There is, a, there is a meningococcal B vaccine available. Um, it's, it's a different type of vaccine. Uh, it's not recommended by the National Advisory Committee on Immunization uh, to uh, have publicly funded programs for offering that meningococcal B for the broad population like we do with the quadrivalent vaccine. That's for a number of specific reasons. It's a different type of vaccine. Um, there are many different substrains of meningococcal B, and not all of them are protected by the, the mening meningococcal B vaccine. So if you immunize people well ahead of time of possible exposure, then you're not sure that you're going to get protection against the strain that's around. Uh, when we look at the epidemiology of meningococcal disease, it's a rare disease. It can have some fatal consequences, absolutely. Um, and my, my condolences to the families that have been affected in the, in the last few years. But it is a rare disease. Uh, and that's some of that is we have infectious diseases that occasionally can, can, provide, can, can create very rapid and catastrophic consequences. And we can't prevent all of that. Um, we also know that who's at risk from meningococcal B, it's very specific. So we know that in all meningococcal disease, the, much, the, the, much, the highest rates uh, by far are in young infants. Then we have a little bit of a surge in preschool age, grades four, five, six. Then another little bit of an uptake in younger uh, adults. Uh, but it's not all young adults. We know specifically who's at risk for increased meningococcal disease are people, adults leaving school and going and living in congregate living settings that used to be more military recruits. Now we see it uh, most frequently, but still very rare, rare in, um, in university dormitories. And that simply, be, the fact is that about 10% of the pop general population will have what we call carriers. They have this bacteria in their nose and throat. Uh, doesn't cause any infection. When you and, and each of them bring the strains that uh, or the substrains that are actually in their community. So when you bring people from a range of communities across Nova Scotia, from across the country, into a university residence, what we see is the increase, uh, increased transmission because of that congregate living setting, and the rate of nasal carriage can go up to 20 percent. So it's that 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 very specific group, young people entering university, specifically living in um, in residence. Um, and so for all that, there are the, the rationale, that's why NASI says that we should, that there's not good rationale for a publicly funded program for everybody. We need a very targeted program. Um, and no, no province publicly funds this. We have, uh, we certainly use meningococcal vaccine for higher and, and publicly funded for people who are at high risk. When we have individual cases and then we know it's a meningococcal B strain, we use the vaccine for those close contacts. And then we have, when we have an outbreak like we had an outbreak before Christmas and a, in a single residence on Dalhousie, we vaccinated very quickly all of the people in that residence because of the, the potential they were at higher risk. We have started a conversation uh, Monday had a phone call uh, starting a discussion with post-secondary institutions in Nova Scotia, uh, and they were very anxious to expand that from an Atlantic perspective. So how we will be moving forward, public health will be working with post-secondary institutions and from an Atlantic perspective, how we can work together to increase awareness of who is actually at increased risk and the availability of a vaccine, and also when the appropriate timing of that, of that vaccine would be and then also discussions about how we may work together to reduce cost barriers uh, to that vaccine. Many universities are already looking at how through their university health plans uh, and making arrangements with the vaccine manufacturers to reduce costs. So we're moving forward, we're going to have those very specific conversations with our post-secondary uh, colleagues. Emily McGuire. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, I would ask that we keep our answer short. We, we have a limited time, and I appreciate the detailed answer. The conditions that you, you described, Dr. Strang, about close contact, and that describes HRM to a T. People are living in dorms, they're going to the bars, uh, and we react when there's a death. You did mention NASI, and you said that NASI uh, does not recommend that, and that the reason being NASI does not recommend. But NASI recommends that we support, uh, that we fully fund shingles. They also recommend that we fund uh, high, the, the vaccine, uh, the flu vaccine for seniors. And yet we're not doing that in Nova Scotia. And so my, my question is, is if NASI's recommending shingles and, and the, the flu vaccine for seniors, uh, we're not doing that, but they're, they're not recommending meningitis B. Like we can't have it both way. That, that's one of, the, one of the issues that I have here. And we are a very specific group here in HRM. We have students from all around, and, and the, the age of people that are coming to our universities are the age of individuals that are at the most risk, the highest risk for meningitis B. Um, I had a close, and I talked to Nori about this, I had a close personal friend who was not in university at the time who caught it from a bar, going to the bar in HRM. So we, we're inviting students into the school to, to, our, uh, to HRM. We're telling them to go into dormitories and close quarters, and then we're also uh, obviously asking them to go to restaurants and bars and spend their money, and this is how it's spreading here in Nova Scotia. We, kn we do know that HRM in Nova Scotia in particular has some of the higher rates uh, than other areas of Canada. So my question is, is, is why, do we not, why can't we make an exception, even though it's not happening right across Canada, why can't we make a, an exception here in Nova Scotia, here in HRM, in our university populated uh, cities and, and, and municipalities and say, uh, these individuals are at high risk, these individuals are more likely to carry than anyone else, and one death is too many, and, and let's fund this. Not, let's not rely on the universities, because we know the universities now are, are, are starting to roll this out. But let's make sure that everybody gets vaccinated for meningitis B that's in a high-risk um, situation, but also a high-risk age group, like we did with COVID. Like, we've proven we can do this. And so, you know, NASI's saying no to this, but they're saying yes to shingles and stuff. So it's, we're kind of back and forth on, on what we do. We're, and I know it's not on you, but we're, we're, we're kind of back and forth as governments on what we do and do not follow depending on NASI recommendations. Dr. Strang. Two quick responses. We uh, certainly, the, both proposals have been developed around for those, the two other vaccines you mentioned, and they are certainly continue to be considered along with a whole range of other cost pressures in the health system. Uh, so they are, they're actively uh, under, under discussion around with all, as I said, with all sorts of other things. Around meningococcal B, we do not have higher rates than the rest of the country. Uh, we are not, no, we are not. You look at, look at the numbers. Uh, it's a rare event. So yeah, and, and unfortunately, rare events sometimes happen. But we are working with universities on, on, and it's a very specific targeted group. You don't get meningococcal B just from going to bars. That individual you mentioned must have had some exposure, much closer exposure somewhere else. Uh, so it's a very focused, targeted vaccination program we need to have. Um, and uh, we, as I said, moving forward, we are working with universities to raise awareness. Many of them are, uh, universities are taking steps to reduce costs, and we'll be at the table thinking about how we may, uh, again, for a very specific specific targeted group. It would be students coming into university first year, uh, potentially those only living in residence. That, that's who we should need to focus on and how do we work with that group uh, around knowing that many of them are in different parts of the country and they should be immunized before they even get here. So that's an issue about how do you, you know, work uh, and, and raise awareness and decrease costs. But we are, those conversations will be ongoing. MLA McGuire. Lastly, my last quick question. I appreciate the the clarification, Dr. Strang, um, is, is on the information piece. And part of this is, is as public health, it, it is uh, the duty of public health uh, to, to uh, get that information out there to make sure that people are aware of the, these uh, issues. Um, you said that you are working with the universities. Are you working also with the general public on awareness around meningitis B? Be two, Sorry. 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 Yeah, yeah, sorry. Dr. Strang. 
I mean, we do, uh, you know, there's other types of mignonette. So all our vaccination programs is, you know, there are, there's information about this disease that we're vaccinating against at infants and again in, in grade seven. Specifically, the meningococcal B, uh, there'll be two main streams of our work through the working group. One will be information and awareness. So how do we actually give students who are at the time and the situations when they're at greater risk, make sure they're aware of the, of the recommendation for a, for a meningococcal vaccine. And the second line of work will be around how do we reduce barriers, in, in, including financial barriers. Thank you. thank you, Doctor. Emily DiCostanzo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you to all. And I honestly wanted two questions regarding mental health, because I'm the critic for mental health. But I do have another question that has bothered me. And I want to know what um, what is, I know you are in, uh, mainly in charge of policy and, and the bigger picture. And to, uh, today I heard a lot of things that we can't fix gaps, we need to mitigate problems. And the last one I loved even better, inflammation before an eruption, uh, uh, before to, an inflammation before it gets erupted. And I see some, an inflammation that is going to happen in a big way, and that is the 130,000 um, people who have no family doctors, and we keep giving uh, Band-Aid solutions, whether it is, and I see that public health is actually sending a mobile primary care. So that is, to me, is, is wonderful service, but it's again a, a Band-Aid, and it's causing this big issue that I see, all these um, patients without doctors, where is their information going? Every time we send them to a mobile, every time we give them uh, a, a virtual care, these are all wonderful things but they have no central information, and this information is getting lost, I would be really upset as a um, doctor to, and it's a liability to doctors to treat people without knowing the history. The history is being lost for all these patients, and no one is looking at the bigger picture of what's gonna happen in the future to those people, and we keep adding, and then we take doctors uh, from the family doctors who now are doing virtual care, we are doing mobile, and we have no central system to keep that history for those patients. It's liability for the patient, it's liability for the doctor. Who is looking at this bigger issue and the policy when you're sitting together? Is public health involved in this? Directed to ML. Whoever can answer okay. who's doing Ms. policy in public health. Ms. Ms. Trott. Dr. Strang to jump in as well, as well here. So uh, the work of public health is, is not that directly connected to delivery of actual care with doctors. We're really on more of that prevention, uh, prevention side. So we have, um, we have loaned our um, mobile units that work so well for us during, during the pandemic to help support some pop-up clinics for primary care access. But... Um, it's not, that's not the work of, of this team that's uh, on the primary care and acute side. So we can only speak to our, the public health component and, and we do think we have a role to play in helping to um, really divert folks from having to get care because if we can invest on their health, then we'll, we'll take more burden off of, off of the system. But in the short term primary care um, challenges, it's, that's not, um, that's uh, not the solutions from from public health. MLA D. Costanzo. Sorry to interrupt, but this is a solu I'm sorry. You, you, this is a, a prevention, right? This is a big problem that's about to happen in a couple of years. We already have people who have been without a doctor for two, three years. Where is that information going, and how uh, the pharmacists or or doctors who are treating them know what medication they've been on? What history do they have in, med in, in, in medical uh, issues that can cause a, a liability to the doctor themselves? Who is looking at this bigger picture? And to me, these are policy people. And you are the policy people. So how come you're not looking at this? Sorry. Dr. Strang. 
Yeah, certainly the integration of health information is, is is not new and is an important issue. There is a whole initiative around one called One Patient, One Record, that I'm sure you're aware of, OPOR, mm -hmm. and that that's meant to do that. There's a certain legally when people go any clinical visit like that, there needs to be some rec clinical record uh, created. So there would be there. It's the integration of all that. That is not public health. There are uh, par other parts of the health system, and as I said, there's a whole initiative OPOR which is meant to do that, integrate all these all these records together. Ultimately, public health will contribute to that. Through we have our own information system that we use for our work called Panorama, and certainly, especially the vaccine in records are part of that, will be integrated into OPR over time. Emily DiCostanzo with about four minutes remaining. So OPOR hasn't been in, in any talk that I've heard recently on any of the solutions that, the, uh, that was said yesterday, right? We have issues that's going to develop even worse for the emergency if they're showing up at emergency without history. And 130,000 people are showing up without any health uh, uh, history, and no one is talking about that. Yesterday, that was not part of the solution. We're just taking doctors from this area, putting them here, and all Band-Aid solutions. That's all I keep hearing, and I'm, I'm just going to leave it at that. I hope you guys can take this and, and, and help the department to come up with some solution before it erupts, before this inflammation erupts in a big way that I see. Um, my other quick question, if I may, is the mental health. Um, you know, this government has promised universal mental health, and we know that Nova Scotians are struggling. Is public health currently involved in the expansion of mental health services in Nova Scotia? Ms. Trott? Cough, and I'll <clears throat> ask Dr. Strang to, to come in here. So there, because they, we do work closely with our colleagues in the Office of Addictions and Mental Health on many fronts that I'll ask uh, Dr. Strang to speak to because it is it's a very important and it is part of overall public health absolutely and there's some key areas where collaboration is happening and will continue to happen around the development of um, plans around solution six around wellness and really focusing on um, like those tier one tier two um, levels around um, you know peer providing peer support using activity things like that um, that do kind of cross over from a public health and addictions and mental health component. But there are specific things that Dr. Strang is working on with uh, the chief of the office of addictions and mental health around supportive housing uh, and things like that. So I don't know, Rob, if you want to mention. Dr. Strang. Yeah, we work very closely. There's a, a, a lot of connection. Uh, when we talk about mental health, we talk about there's five tiers. The, fir the first two tiers, the bottom ones, are really uh, outside of the healthcare system, and that is the work of public health. And then as you get uh, the need for uh, more specialized clinical, those are the th tiers three, four, and five, uh, which is the mental health care system. So we do a lot of work in schools, for instance, uh, through our health promoting schools process, uh, the work we're doing around physical activity, there's growing evidence that people who are in even 10 minutes a day in wa walking outside in nature improves your, your mental health. So we need to distinguish between s people who have diagnosed psychiatric illness and need care from the, the health care system side versus mental wellness, which is the broader population. And this it's no different than physical wellness, where all those factors that you've heard uh, us talk about, socioeconomic factors, uh, what is our physical environment that promotes nature, access to nature, walking, healthy food, social connection, uh, that's the work that public health is involved, which ultimately has a major impact on people's uh, uh, mental health. The other piece we're working on directly is around people who have significant addiction and often combined addiction mental health issues who are often, you know, often um, on the streets, homeless, uh, and, and our opioid strategy in 2016 that we're continuing to work there very closely with our colleagues in mental health and addiction. How do we actually address those who are most marginalized with very severe mental health and addiction issues? And the issue that my uh, ADM Trot mentioned around supportive housing is one that we need to pay more attention to. We know the evidence that if you uh, provide those type of individuals with a stable housing, you'll get better outcomes from your treatment of their mental health and or addiction issues. So we're working very collaboratively in those areas. Emily D. Costanzo, six seconds. Thank you, Dr. Strang, for this. Thank you, everybody. 
We will now switch to the NDP caucus for their 20 minutes, beginning with MLA LeBlanc. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for being here and for everything that you're doing and, and have been doing in these, well, forever, but also in the last, you know, crisis years as, as, uh, as it happens. Um, I want to say, first of all, uh, yeah, so I represent a riding where there's a significant population of vulnerable people. So lots of precarious housing. Yesterday in my office, uh, I talked to um, uh, my constituency coordinator. 13 people came in for help yesterday in one you know, eight hour day, and th the first three at least were uh, people who were being rent evicted. Uh, the other day there was a lady in who was a senior citizen who is literally couch surfing because she has nowhere to, nowhere to live. And this is totally usual, like this is happening all the time. And so I want to uh, say thank you for bringing the attention to the social determinants of health. Precarious housing, poverty, uh, little access to nutritious food. These are all things that literally will keep our population more healthy. You are the experts. You know this. But I just want to say that like, I, I see this every single day, the results or the results of the, of the inaction on that and the, in, the inaction of the or the, uh, the results of the disinvestment, uninvestment, whatever. Um, so that being said, I want to ask uh, Dr. Fier uh, Furlbeck and or Dr. Kirk. Um, so we have, you know, someone mentioned the situation in the ERs and how it's strange that we're talking about public health when, when we have this, with this crisis, like this health crisis in front of us. Um, but the fact is they're not unconnected or disconnected. And so uh, we know that we've seen ER, um, the, the situations in ERs uh, deteriorating over the last couple months, including, of course, the highest number of deaths in the last several years, just last month. So I'm wondering if one of you could talk about how the investments in public health can have a knock-on effect uh, on the health system as a whole. So ha basically my question is, if we invest in public health, can you explain how it m we might see results in our emergency departments down the road? Dr. Kirk, Dr. Furlbeck. Do you want to take this one, Catherine? Or right. Dr. Okay. Kovac. So the, um, the connections between uh, the day-to-day the -day lives uh, of, uh, of Nova Scotians and the effects that we see in uh, emergency rooms are very closely connected, but not directly. Uh, we know that if we have a serious accident, we go to emergency, but also emergency uh, departments are filled with people who have uh, chronic conditions that haven't been addressed, um, who are dealing with issues that are a result of where they live, of their lifestyle, of the kinds of pressures that they have every day. We also know that in Nova Scotia, um, uh, small numbers of uh, people are responsible for a high proportion of health costs. I mean, we know that 5% of the population amounts for uh, amounts for about two thirds of inpatient hospital and physician costs. We know that 1% of the population accounts for about a third of these costs. Um, so it's, it's very useful not to mention cost effective to understand and address what's happening on the ground in more detail. Uh, it does as my colleagues have mentioned, uh, a lot of this does get back to prevention, uh, especially with seniors. If we can keep them moving, if we can keep them uh, healthier, longer, if we can provide a stimulating and supportive social environment, then you find a lot of the, the physical uh, problems that they experience um, are mitigated. Uh, and if we have a healthier, older population, then they are less likely to go to emergencies, emergency wards, emergency departments, especially if they don't have primary health care. So it all is interlocking. And if we take our eye off of the quieter, more indirect aspect of uh, health and well-being, then again, we are going to end up sooner or later with more people coming into uh, emergency departments. Dr. Kirk, do you have anything to add or just MLA LeBlanc? Well, uh, Dr. Strang, I think. Dr. Strang. 
Yeah, if you don't mind, I can build on that and just very quickly give a handful of very concrete examples where we could make a difference. Certainly, everybody's aware as we have a healthier population over time, but there are some areas where it have, could have, would have immediate impact that we, are, we do continue to work at. One is vaccination. Uh, uh, we had a flu vaccination program where, yet again, we had less than 40 percent of the population uh, chose to get a flu vaccine. So if we doubled that, there would be a reduction on people going to the emergency department uh, with vaccination. That comes down to people. We publicly fund it. We have big awareness around it, working with pharmacies, but we need more people to get vaccinated. Our work on road safety, a major driver of utilization of emergency departments is trauma, injury. Uh, there's a number of us, so motor vehicle crashes, other types of motorized recreational vehicles, which uh, often tied with alcohol use, have, they have a significant impact. And we have in the past work, this is an, a great example of how we need to work collaboratively with the Department of Justice, with uh, our folks in, uh, in, in transportation, et cetera, that you, how do we have a greater impact on reducing the impact from motor vehicle crashes. Alcohol, other substance use are major drivers of, of, of emergency room uses, and so how do we work collaboratively in those areas to reduce those the, the impacts and a, a safer use of, of legal and illegal substances? Um, so there's th and those would have very immediate impacts, not uh, not to diminish the the things around healthy eating activity, which tend to have longer longer uh, the time span for impacts on, on hospitalizations and emergency departments is is longer. But there are some areas that that is within the scope of the work of public health uh, that, that with greater emphasis and, and attention could have direct and immediate impacts on emergency department utilization. Emily LeBlanc. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Strang. I, I really appreciate the reminder of like the immediate, <laughs> the immediate things that we can be doing too. And I actually, uh, maybe post meeting, I have a couple of other questions about alcohol use for you. But um, uh, I'm wondering. So, speaking of vaccines, then, so our uptake on the flu vaccine was very was quite low, and we heard you talk about this in the news and um, in public forums, uh, and certainly children's vaccines ha have been. Um, very low, and um, I'm wondering, like we have we have uh, in school vaccination programs for, as you said, grade seven vaccination program. So is there, you know, are, are is there a new look at offering COVID nineteen or flu vaccine in the schools for children of a certain age? Doctor Strang, we've looked at that, and really, we have a we have a well established uh, routes of access to both those vaccines, um, and it would take to actually is, uh, have specific clinics in schools for those school aged children would would require a significant redeployment of public health and other resources to create those clinics when we already have well established routes of access. Access is not is not the issue. Money is not the issue. They're publicly funded. We need to work with community to uh, uh, to raise awareness uh, where we do uh, have invested in and will continue to do in public health is using our mobile vans and others so we have with COVID vaccine and we were offering flu vaccine gone into African Nova Scotian communities in partnerships with our First Nations communities uh, to our homeless shelters to disability workshops etc so people who have uh, need more supports uh, to actually get access to vaccine we are we continue to support them uh, but for the general public I would argue that we have lots of already existing points of access that we need to work with communities to raise the awareness and the uptake of those opportunities. Emily LeBlanc. Thank you. I, I have to very respectfully disagree. I, 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 I understand about the points of access, but in fact, I think that if we are talking about a 40% vaccination rate, then, in, then there's obviously something not not uh, not communicating and I honestly don't think you know as a as a as a person who works and my partner works I've got two kids I tried to book them a COVID-19 booster the other day uh, I've said this before <laughs> literally I've tried four times one time we actually showed up at a public clinic and then they were told they couldn't get vaccinated because they had just had their flu vaccine which was not on the website that information but yesterday I looked to try to book them one and the closest uh, with the the soonest vaccine I can get is in on February 11th in my community and I am telling you I do have a car 
but I do not have time to drive my kids across the bridge in the middle of their school day to go to Tantallon or to Spryfield to get a vaccine, vaccine for them. And I could actually take the time to do that, but I am telling you there are many, many people who can't do that. And, and like anyone who has a nine to five job cannot get their kids out of school to get them a vaccine at 11 o'clock. It, it may seem like there's lots of points of access, but in reality, there is not. And I speak as someone with plenty of access and plenty of ability to like take a couple of hours off. Um, so I just, I really beg you to, to look at that again. Um, Yes, thank you. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, I want to go on, speaking of, of other kids, I want to say um, we've seen coverage lately of newborns, newborn babies who don't have access to family doctors, and we know uh, we've seen the positive effect of the mobile units, and I think the mobile units are really amazing, um, but it seems like the lack of access for newborn babies to family doctors is concerning. I'm wondering um, what the impact to general health population, uh, general population health is of uh, having no access to neonatal supports. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, there is a link or you can explain the link between the lack of access to early public health care uh, and what we're seeing in the IWK and children's ERs. Anyone? Ms. DeSantis. Um, thank you for the question. So um, we do have, as you have all discussed here this morning, uh, lots of people without a family care provider. And we know that our population has increased. And we know that the birth rate of uh, for babies who don't have access to family care has uh, increased as well. We are working quite closely right now with the IWK and with primary health care. So predominantly, the infant immunization series is provided by family care providers. Um, that's the common route to get your primary series for immunization. Um, public health, uh, even pre-pandemic, supported the provision of immunizations, infant immunizations, for those babies who didn't have a primary care provider. And we did that work collaboratively, collaboratively with primary health care through a couple of clinics here in HRM. We are back at the table with primary health care currently uh, and the IW. UK discussing how we provide, how we can increase our supports to provide the primary infant immunization uh, for those babies who don't have a primary care provider. Um, I think for the, from the perspective of the mobile units, maybe I'll speak for a minute on that. Uh, Early in the pandemic, we had an opportunity that was, I would say, quite innovative to look at alternate ways to provide service to those who wouldn't otherwise have access uh, at that time to COVID immunization services. And predominantly, that was around um, access to COVID testing. And so uh, we did... Um, very rapidly stand up uh, a fleet of our mobile units and resource them to go out to areas where there was limited access to testing and also to support communities or institutions that had outbreaks when they weren't able to do that testing themselves. Um, we uh, continue to provide that service with our mobile units in public health. Um, we are looking um, future to what are the vision, you know, what's our vision for the use of the mobile units going forward. In the interim, we have loaned two of our mobile units to primary health care and are working quite closely with them. Um, it's no, it was no small feat to build out a service delivery model that was mobile and that was very new to us. And so we had lots of lessons learned that we're sharing with primary health care to support that work. MLA LeBlanc, six minutes, 27 seconds. Thank you, Do Mr. Chair, Dr. Chair. Um, uh, so you did mention um, you did mention earlier that uh, many of the public health programs that have been paused during the pandemic are back up and running. But can you be really clear and brief, if possible, uh, what services still remain on hold? Mr. Yeah. In particular, related to babies and early years and stuff too. Okay. That'd be great, Mr. Santis. Um, so yes, during during the pandemic, most we were under our business continuity plan, and most Order. of our less. It, if you wouldn't mind starting over, your microphone was missed oh, the first so few seconds. I'm so sorry, Mr. Santis. 
Sure. So early in the pandemic, we did suspend a number of our uh, lower priority, although equally as important, programs and services because most of our staff was mobilized into our COVID response. Um, since then, um, we've established uh, interim staffing to hold our COVID work. And so we have reassigned our core public health staff back to their programs and services. Throughout the pandemic, we did not disrupt our immunization services for infants and children. That was something that was maintained as a priority under our plan. Um, so we were, I would say, uh, in some ways quite unique in terms of that across uh, Canada in terms of our ability to maintain that service level. Our early years services, uh, so normally with our uh, postnatally, we do assessments and screenings of moms who give birth to understand what some of the social or other factors that may influence um, the, you know, the health and well-being of their, their infant. Um, we moved those uh, to a high priority, so we screened and triaged the highest risk ones and maintained some level of contact with those. Those services have been restarted now, so we're actively back in our delivery hospitals doing that screening and working with those clients. MLA LeBlanc. So just to, cl just to clarify, it's all back and running. There's no, no, nothing to do with early years or neonatal or any of that stuff with children that is still on pause. We are Miss, Miss DeSantis. Very sorry. Um, yes, we are back to our full suite of services. We are phasing it back in, um, meaning some of our facilities that we work with, we're negotiating with them to get back in, but we're ready now to step back into that work. MLA LeBlanc. And do you, can you tell us when you anticipate that everything will be actually up and running and you'll be back in those places? Ms. DeSantis. Uh, we are actively in that uh, work now. I would say 80% of the uh, population has our, has our full attention in terms of early years. I would say within the next one to two months. MLA LeBlanc. Thank you. And can, you, can someone uh, tell me how many public health nurse vacancies there are? Uh, and are there other uh, job vacancies in public health right now? Ms. DeSantis? I can't tell you explicitly how many nurse vacancies we have. Our vacancy rate is at about 12% over across public health uh, total. Um, that number is pulled from our uh, posting uh, data. And um, there may be domino postings, which mean you it actually may be higher than it actually is. Uh, 40, approximately 40% of our complement uh, in public health is made up of nurses. MLA LeBlanc. I'm, I'm wondering if we could ask, uh, Mr. Chair, the, com the committee could ask to get that exact data um, delivered to us after the meeting or, you know, within a week or so. Certainly bring that up during committee business. MLA oh. LeBlanc. Okay, thanks. Um, okay. Um, sorry. Go. Do you want to go? Do you want to go? <laughs> okay. MLA Burl, two and a half minutes. Uh, we can go back to this. We, we'll, uh, perhaps we'll, we won't have enough time to explore this adequately, but I, one, uh, uh, one aspect of public health that uh, is important, and I think this current moment where we have this convergence of uh, you know, continuing COVID, the cost of living crisis, the ER situation, um, brings it to the fore, and, and that's the matter of paid sick days. Uh, as a, as a way of containing transmissible uh, sickness. So I, I'm, I would like to uh, ask uh, all of uh, our guests today uh, uh, who would be interested in commenting on this, what comments you might have about um, uh, the importance of people staying home when they're sick and the importance of a paid sick days program that makes it financially possible for people, uh, all working people, to be able to do that. Dr. Strang. I'm sorry. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, you've, I don't know how many times I've said stay home if you're sick in the last two and a half years. So, and I've also recognized that for many people, there are a lot of barriers around that, family barriers, work barriers. So certainly the concept of how do we make sure that people have, uh, aren't oh, unduly um, penalized financially by staying home and not going to work uh, is an important issue. Uh, certainly the, the policy uh, levers, if you will, on that are not within the responsibility to public health, but it certainly is an issue that we need to look at around, uh, I would say, not just financial, but, but what are all the multiple barriers that uh, when people are sick, they, uh, they actually feel they need to go and continue to work. 
MLA Burrell. Uh, well, Mr. Chair, uh, with just a few seconds left, perhaps we could uh, return to this question and provide uh, uh, people from the department if they wanted to uh, elaborate on what Dr. Strang has said, an opportunity to do that, and then we could return to uh, uh, our guest from Dalhousie to uh, comment on this when he comes back to our opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, MLA Burrell. Turning our attention to the PC caucus, we will begin with MLA Barcos. MLA Barcos. Thank you. Um, Mr. Santos, uh, public health has played a key important role um, during COVID-19, and you brought up uh, the mobile units. You even made it to Little and Big Tancock, so thank you. You're making it to the islands. Uh, can you speak to other ways of public health that public health um, work across the province that we and our constituents may not be familiar with. For example, I was one of the very first healthy beginning nurses back when the, the province f first started the program. So is there any, um, is there anything that maybe we don't know of? Ms. DeSantis. I'm learning. <laughs> so I, I think our, I'll start by saying our services are quite broad in terms of the scope of the work that we do. So we've talked a lot about, uh, and we all know a lot about COVID and our case and contact and outbreak management where it comes to COVID and we do similar work um, with all of the other notifiable diseases that are reportable to us. In addition to that, and it's been touched on briefly, uh, we do provide uh, harm reduction supports and services to some of our uh, needle exchange uh, community organization partners. Um, we also, of course, provide immunization services that are broadly done throughout our school-based immunization program and provide those supports to babies who don't have care providers. Um, in terms of our other supports and services, in uh, you know, in early years, for example, we do uh, work with new parents to do screening and assessment, uh, provide uh, re referrals to parenting uh, resources and supports. Uh, we provide breastfeeding supports as another example. In our healthy communities work, which I think is uh, one of the one of the areas of focus that maybe is least well known is that it's what we are talking about here today. It's that primordial prevention work really in terms of trying to identify those social determinants or structural determinants of health and work to influence change so that people have an environment in which they can make uh, healthy decisions. And so we do that work around injury prevention, uh, food security, um, homelessness and housing. Uh, those are all broad pieces of work that we do. Um, and of course, the driver of all of that is really understanding the health needs of our population. And so we do that through gathering evidence uh, and surveillance to look for areas in which there may be either barriers to services and care and supports that may be physical, but are often more discreet than that. Um, and by that I mean when we look at uh, some of the root causes of poor health, it's how we identify what those are and bringing supports and services to those groups using an equity-based lens. MLA Barcos. Thank you. Um, Ms. Trott. Um, how do other areas of government, including other partnerships and stakeholders, support public health's overall goal? Ms. Trott. Thanks for the question. A lot of the work of public health is done in partnership um, across, across government uh, departments. And as we think about looking at the social determinants of health, like there's many other uh, departments that have programs that actually contribute to that as well. So. Um, specifically for public health, we work with the Department of Environment and Climate Change um, because they coordinate the assessment response to reported or suspected health hazards in many settings. So there are our inspection arm actually are part of the Department of Environment and Climate Change. Um, we know the work of Communities, Culture, Tourism and Heritage, for example, um, have a, a, a large focus on uh, not only sport and recreation and physical activity, but also arts and culture and community development kind of overall. So um, play an important role in social determinants. Um, 
more specifically labor skills and immigration they're working towards safer workplaces for Nova Scotians um, Department of Education early childhood developments working towards that ten dollar a day daycare um, which is an important piece municipal affairs and housing working to ensure Nova Scotians have access to safe housing um, we're working with community services on childhood poverty so um, working very closely on some solutions there uh, even you know own new affairs as it supports the social and economic well-being of communities and uh, seniors in long-term care with our aging population so um, as we think about um, some planning ahead around solution six in action for health uh, that's focused on broad well-being uh, health and well-being for citizens in Nova Scotia these are the folks that we'll be bringing to the table uh, to be convened with to to hear about what they can be um, actioning as well as we work together to try to create a, a healthy uh, Nova Scotia for citizens. Thank Emily you. Barcos. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Dr. Strang, um, how does public health identify and respond to new diseases or viruses? Dr. Strang. Thank you for the question. So uh, we are connected, you know, there's a countries uh, there's basically you know an international kind of network where um, any emerging disease uh, would be identified so I'll use the example of, of COVID I mean we first became aware of something unusual happening with respiratory illness in Wuhan China at the end of uh, December 2019 uh, our lead on that is the Public Health Agency of Canada, uh, but I know me and my medical officers that we are, you know, there's listservs and other things from it that we all get this kind of intelligence gathering uh, about an emerging uh, disease. Uh, in Canada, the pu public health is the one part of the healthcare system which actually has an organized structure to facilitate uh, collaboration between provinces, territories, and the federal government. So. Council of Chief Medical Officers of Health as well as the Public Health Network and so we have regular mechanisms that information about an emerging disease whether it's an infectious disease or or something else that uh, that is shared um, once that's kind of on our horizon um, and then we uh, we you know I think COVID is a good example we then we we start to communicate to our health system uh, partners uh, including primary care physicians, primary care pharmacists, et cetera, around this emerging disease, how, what they should be looking for, if necessary, what laboratories, you know, tests should be done, all those kind of things. And that could happen not just with an emerging disease if we have uh, a reoccurrence of, of measles in another part of the world. Uh, that may, be, may increase the risk uh, of it appearing here in Nova Scotia. We'll do that communication through the healthcare system. And then ultimately there are requirements for notifiable diseases to be reported uh, uh, by, by people in the healthcare system and if necessary we would add a new disease to that list of notifiable uh, diseases to require its reporting we have done that for COVID um, and so that's kind of how the system works global intelligence we get early alerts and then we work as appropriately across the health system to make sure healthcare providers are aware of this emerging, uh, uh, whether it's a re-emerging disease or just a reoccurrence that might have a greater chance of it appearing here in, in, in Nova Scotia or a true newly emerging disease like COVID. MLA Barcos. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Um, that made me think of a few more questions, but there are four of us, and so I'm going to share the time and pass this off to MLA Palmer. MLA Palmer. Thank you, MLA Barcos. And uh, welcome, everybody. Good morning. Uh, this has been a fascinating conversation so far, and uh, I'm sure, like myself, people watching this today are learning an awful lot about the work that, that you do do. Um, I'm going to just direct a couple questions about the funding. Uh, that's that's been happening and before we do that I just wanted to confirm a couple of things I've heard uh, Dr. Kirk in your opening comments you, you um, made a comment that with proper funding for public health we could see a return of investment on both 14 to 1 with the for outcomes uh, for with well-funded public health uh, 
And uh, Dr. Furlbeck, you had mentioned that before, sorry, I'm gonna look at the screen over here. Uh, you had mentioned in your opening statement that uh, before COVID, pre-COVID, Nova Scotia was drastically, uh, you know, behind other provinces in its public health funding. Um, and Dr. Strang, in your opening comments, you made the point of saying that we're in uh, year two of what you call year uh, public health renewal 2.0. Um, so my question, uh, with, just wanted to confirm some of those, those comments. Um, my question in, in, is in regards to funding, and we've seen an increase in investment uh, to uh, public health uh, in the last year, and, um, approximately $12 million. I was wondering if uh, maybe uh, Mr. Ms. DeSantis or Ms. Heatley or uh, anyone on the panel, uh, if you could speak to how those investments have been made and how they're affecting communities, maybe in rural communities like the ones that I represent. Ms. Heatley. Ms. Heatley. No, no, it'll come on. There you go. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, so that new investment has been uh, across a number of areas. Uh, Dr. Strang spoke to the core functions of public health, and what we were really focused on with that investment was really making sure we had what we needed across those core functions. Uh, I think Ms. DeSantis will speak to uh, exactly what was done in Nova Scotia Health. Within the Department of Health and Wellness, um, that additional investment went to increasing our complement of medical officers of health. So those are our public health specialist physicians uh, who are placed across the province. So they are in all zones and uh, would be reporting into Dr. Strang's office. Uh, the additional investment also went towards hiring more epidemiologists within the Department of Health and Wellness. Um, and it was spoken to earlier about the importance of good data um, and our ongoing surveillance to understand what's happening in our communities. And that is exactly uh, what those folks are doing. They're monitoring the health of the population. They are the, the folks behind all of the COVID reporting that you see every week and all of the data that we're uh, producing on our website, as, as well as uh, working closely with the epidemiologists in Nova Scotia Health. The other area I'll touch on around that investment um, is new resourcing to establish a public health emergency preparedness program within DHW. Uh, so that is new for us. We, um, we obviously have worked closely for many years with our, our emergency preparedness colleagues. And now with this new investment, we will have staff that are fully dedicated to uh, public health emergency preparedness specifically, working closely, of course, with, uh, with our colleagues in Nova Scotia Health, Emergency Management Office, and uh, Nova Scotia Environment. I'll pass it over to you, Marcia, then. Ms. DeSantis. So, uh, so with our uh, enhanced capacity funding, um, we, in year one, which was the fiscal year ending 2022, we predominantly focused on increasing our complement around our health protection work. Um, you know, we had implemented our panorama surveillance system and uh, realized that our workforce uh, wasn't uh, we didn't have the capacity we needed to fully implement and use that system in in its intended manner so our first year enhancements were predominantly in the area of health protection so adding public health nurses public health investigators um, we also built a training and quality assurance team um, which helps us bring consistency and quality to our work um, in addition to that, we also added epidemiologists to our complement and some additional communication support. Uh, also uh, with some pharmacy practice assistance. So the volume of vaccine that we're distributing each year has drastically increased. Um, so we uh, increased the number of staff for that. Uh, this year, this fiscal year, we have uh, focused uh, more around our early years uh, core program staff. Um, we've added additional community home visitors. So these are staff that go out and work with new parents and families who require some additional supports. And we're working with Dodge Agamic right now to actually uh, increase uh, enhanced home visiting in our First Nations communities. Um, we've also hired a few additional early years public health nurses. And we do have a planned expansion of our youth health centers. Um, that uh, that we're getting ready to to fill. Emily Palmer. Thank you very much, um, uh, Ms. Trout. You talked about some of the collaboration and work with other departments and the work that public health does. Um, my 
question specifically this time is about the work between uh, Nova Scotia Health and the Department of Health and Wellness and how you work uh, to get and how it all works together with public health uh, to come up with the decisions regarding public health funding. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the, how that works? Miss Miss Trott? Be, uh, Jen Heatley could jump in here as well, but uh, we do a lot of planning together, and we work we work so closely with our partners, and um, and really it's about understanding where the needs are, um, and then uh, working together on assessing what the possibilities could be, and developing business cases, and bringing those forward for for review and for for budget uh, consideration. But um, you know, I think it's really important that we're focusing on. What those shared goals are, what's the highest priorities, and um, and and coming together. But we we really do work quite closely together on that, and uh, and our folks in in NSH are, are on the ground and seeing people every day, and so we we certainly take um, what they're seeing and hearing out there um, as really important to as we think about what new programs could be and and how we would proceed with funding. Uh, Ms. Heatley, did you have anything you wish to add? Thank you. Um, so building on what ADM Trot said, uh, we work extremely closely with Nova Scotia Health uh, to identify priorities and, and move things forward, as, as ADM Trot noted. We are, uh, especially coming out of COVID, we are in a bit of a rebuild mode right now uh, and are establishing, we've established a new governance system. So we have a public health steering committee, which includes uh, many of the, the folks here at this table, as well as subcommittees uh, focused on the core functions of public health so that we ensure that our DHW staff, as well as our Nova Scotia Health staff, are in ongoing communication and planning together. Uh, we are two sides of the same coin, so ensuring that we are setting priorities together uh, and working together effectively as a system. MLA Palmer. Thank you very much. I appreciate all your answers and uh, thanks for being here. I'll pass it over to my colleague, MLA Sheehy Richard. MLA Sheehy Richard with three minutes, 38 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to jump right in and pick up on some things that we talked about earlier in relation to the public health mobile units. Uh, so Ms. DeSantis is probably to you, um, and more in particular, how they were utilized during COVID and um, in fact are still being utilized for both testing and vaccine. And you alluded to something about what they might be doing in the future. Can you go into a little more detail about that for me? Ms. DeSantis. So the. Uh, the work of the mobile units right now stays focused closely around our uh, access to testing for COVID testing as it continues. And I would say this is one of the areas where we are finding ourselves more in rural areas throughout the province. Um, and that's really based on accessibility. So we do a lot of mapping to determine um, whether or not certain communities uh, have access to testing. So the work of the mobile units currently is still primarily focused around uh, COVID testing. We are expanding uh, our work with our mobile units to include uh, immunization both for uh, COVID immunization and uh, in some areas where there might be uh, less access to flu vaccine, provision of flu vaccine. Um, I did mention earlier we are working closely with primary health care right now to support their uh, pop-ups, their mobile clinics that they're running. In terms of vision going forward, um, you know, we are expected to maintain our current service provision for COVID, and we are actively uh, involved with research and innovation doing evaluation of our mobile unit outreach work, which will help us uh, understand what worked well and what maybe could use some tweaks uh, moving forward. And I think the long-term vision for public health is how could we bring supports or services to communities that may be underserviced that fit within the scope of public health. And so um, I would say we're uh, still learning. Um, we're still actively providing the services that we're expected to provide with those, but we are looking now towards uh, the future of the mobile units. And Mali Sheehy Richard. Thank you. And so I know that my office is, I'm in a rural uh, constituency, and I know that my office gets notified. You're in good communication with me. So we try to share it um, with, you know, on our pages, anything, even if there's one, you know, in a traveling distance. But 
for the general public, if, if they are, are you sharing information about how to find these, like with schools, or um, is it primarily website related, or how does that word uh, get out? Ms. DeSantis. So uh, the mobile units are uh, the information around where they're going, um, you know, dates, times, locations is all posted on our website and shared broadly. We do work closely with some of our municipal partners uh, as well and uh, with our libraries have been another great partner in this work with us. So we share that information quite broadly through social media predominantly. Ms. Sheehy Richard, 20 seconds. 20 seconds. <laughs> Thank you for your answers. Uh, we'll move on to the next round of questioning, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the second round of questioning, looking at the time, we should have about five minutes per caucus, which will take us to about 11.38, a couple minutes for wrapping up and closing remarks, and then on to committee business. So five minutes for the Liberal Caucus, starting now. MLA, uh, thank, MLA you. thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and first of all, thank you all for being here today. And um, I will say that uh, in regards to access to vaccines, I, I think a big part of it, and, and we've got a lot of smart people around the table here, um, is I think there's a bit of vaccine fatigue maybe in the general public, and I know that's something that you're, you're fighting desperately to overcome. Um, so <clears throat> I want to thank you for, uh, quite frankly, giving us uh, the best, literally the best uh, COVID response in the country. And I know that a lot of you were recognized and some of you weren't, but uh, you did a hell of a job. So thank you for everything you did and, and know that you are appreciated. Um, the one thing I will say is that, um, you know, we know that, uh, and I just quickly want to, we know the high dose uh, flu vaccine for seniors is available in, in, in seniors' homes. Um, and NASI does recommend that it is available for all seniors over the age of 75. Um, does I just, I just like to know, does, does, does public health agree with this recommendation and will this recommendation be fulfilled? And the reason I want to bring this up is, is because listening here today, I've heard a lot of encouraging things about cooperation, but more so about proactive. And, you know, Dr. Strang and a few, a few of you touched on 10 minutes of exercise a day and eating healthy and, and limiting the amount of alcohol you consume. And we're seeing all this in the media now. And we're hearing about it, and it's something that really could help take the stress off our healthcare system. Um, so, preventative instead of reactive healthcare, I think, is one of the ways and one of the things we need to be concentrating on. So, I'm just wondering when it comes to something like the high dose flu vaccine, this is potentially a proactive measure for seniors. Is it something that public health agrees with, and is it something that we can, we will see in the near future? Dr. Strang. Thanks for the question. So, as, as I said earlier, uh, we certainly have put uh, proposals forward uh, in the budget process, um, and you know, what, in the budget process, uh, governments make have to make lots of decisions about uh, uh, around priorities and things. So that it's there, and uh, uh, we'll, we're we're anticipating uh, some kind of you know decisions on that. Uh, that's out of our our control at this point. M. L. E. McGuire. Thank you for that, and so uh, I hope I hope that the government does see the the importance of that. And uh, uh, lastly, what I want to ask is, um, you, again, an incredible job was done during COVID, uh, rolling out the information and getting access to vaccines and really getting into those communities and and actually. Uh, in some cases, keeping that infrastructure in place, especially in communities where there may be a natural distrust with government and public health. And I, I applaud you all for that. I think the general public hasn't seen that kind of work that's happened. Um, what, I what I would like to know is um, what, it, like, w we know that there is vaccine fatigue. So right now, what is the uptake in um, the number of flu shots this year, and is it higher or lower than in past years? And do you correlate that with vaccine wear fatigue from the last few years? And what can we do as as leaders to to improve that? Doc, Dr. Strang. So we know at our just looking at the data up to as of up to January 10th that our overall population coverage for flu vaccine was almost 35 percent. Basically, within what's typically what we see, 35 to 40 percent, we had 
uh, you know, 60 to 70 percent, uh, if I'm recollecting correctly, in community living seniors over 65, and then in long-term care facilities, uh, we have over 90 percent coverage. Uh, so what we what we've seen this year is is exactly what we've what we've typically seen, and very you know very low uptake in flu vaccine in young in young children, and the other concerning group is in in pregnant women where there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, so we, we continue to work in our partnership uh, with both family physicians and uh, pharmacists. I think pharmacists, we've been doing that for about 10 years now, and that's been very successful in terms of promotion of, uh, of flu vaccine, substantively increasing the opportunities seven days a week, evening, all those things through pharmacists. Um, across the country, people in my position and others, we, we put our heads, you know, there's nobody has a really good answer to how do we actually make make people pay more attention to influenza vaccination um your your question what we can all do i think if i can be a bold enough to say all of all of us in this room are in leadership positions so first of all as our example are we all getting a flu vaccination and we're making people aware that we are getting a flu vaccine um and i think we also have to promote that vaccination is not just for ourselves but it's for our oh. communities and really push that message about we care for each other by getting vaccinated order thank you dr strang the ndp caucus mla burrell Thank you. Uh, so I, I would like to ask Dr. Kirk and Dr. Frobeck, and then uh, after that, if other members of the department would like to add to what Dr. Strang has said, uh, to comment on the on the importance of paid sick days, uh, so that uh, working people can can afford to uh, do this important thing, stay home when you're sick, uh, uh, as a means of supporting the health of the public. Dr. Kirk, I'll give it a go. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I think. It is, it is a, that's part of the social safety net that we need to be thinking about and how that interferes and, and interacts with our health system. Um, I personally think it's something that we absolutely should do. Um, I think it's along the lines of, um, again, anything that's like to reduce poverty, all of those things are social and structural uh, determinants of health and things that we should be investing in um, because we know um, that that will actually um, support people um, and, and also prevent the spread of infection, because obviously that's what we saw with, with the COVID-19 pandemic, is that infection um, is spread by people going to work when they're sick. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's certainly something that we should be doing in terms of the, you know, addressing the upstream um, causes of the causes that we're, we're dealing with. Dr. Furlbeck, did you have anything to add? Mm, the policy framework surrounding paid sick, day, sick, paid sick days is a bit complicated because it does encompass both private and public sectors, and it's, again, very specific to the kind of work being done. Uh, because this is 2023, for example, my teaching now includes a virtual link so that all those who feel contagious have the option of joining virtually. But of course, most kinds of employment don't have that option, and so the optimal level of support for those who really need it has to be addressed more precisely. And of course, we really have to be focusing on those who are the most vulnerable and who are working the low income jobs and don't have a choice of you know, joining virtually. Thank you, Dr. Emily Burrell. Are there members of the department other that would like to speak to this? Other than Dr. Shane? Maybe. MLA, MLA Burrell. Thank you. Uh, well then uh, I would like to go back, uh, Dr. Frobeck, you in your introductory comments uh, were making a number of comparisons to where we stand on uh, public health funding in Nova Scotia, uh, per capita spending uh, and, and percentage wise. Uh, and in the comparisons you were making, uh, uh, our situation didn't seem altogether uh, stellar. Uh, so could you characterize a little more, maybe precisely, where are we in the pack of the 10 provinces? And uh, and and could you perhaps speak to, and maybe uh, Dr. Kirk could speak to this as well, what might be uh, some of the things that we would look to do if we were in a, in a stronger funding position of public health that we're not doing now? Dr. Ferrellbeck. Thanks. I haven't looked at all the provinces in great detail, but I would say we're close to the bottom, if not at the very bottom. Um, and it's it's not simply about the amount of funds that we're getting, but also the way that the funds are allocated. Uh, comparatively speaking, uh, next to Nova Scotia, which I'm pretty sure is 
probably dead last when it comes to public funding, uh, public health funding. Quebec spends the least on public health. And that's because they implemented a 30% reduction in public health spending a few years ago. And this was premised on the idea that you could centralize many functions of public health and save money that way. But of course, you know, many provinces have centralized their health governance, but is centralization too pat a solution? So public health has a number of functions. And the problem is that one size does not fit all. You know, the pandemic certainly showed the utility of a top-down structurally tight model of operation, but Zoonotic protection and disaster management is not the only function of public health. Uh, the, as we know, the non-medical determinants of health also play a major role. So it's it's also critical to understand what's happening from the ground up. So centralizing everything at the top, which may have worked fine during COVID, means that we're going to have to start, you know, thinking about what's happening at the ground level. And again, a key function of public health is to act as the eyes and the ears of the health of the population. Um, so we have to be careful not to think about saving costs by centralizing too many functions uh, at the highest level of government. MLA Burrell or any other members of the panel? Dr. Kirk, there's only 20 seconds left if you'd like to. Um, I, well, I'd actually want to go back to the point that um, MLA Palmer raised about querying the, um, the 14 to 1 return on investment, because that return on investment um, is actually higher when you start thinking about things that government can do. So legislation, for example, increases that return on investment. Order. Apologies, Dr. Kirk. Don't mean to be rude. The PC caucus, we're turning to MLA White. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Santos, earlier you spoke a little bit about the school-based immunization program. I wonder if you can take a few minutes to tell us about the, the benefits of that program to rural communities. Ms. DeSantis. So the school-based immunization program is offered in grade 7, and it's one of our universal programs, meaning it's offered in every grade 7 school across the province. Um, and... Um, there are four vaccines that are offered. Uh, it is given in a in in two time periods. So there's a, a, a fall piece of that work and then a spring piece of that work. And um, you know the the benefits of of uh, having a school based immunization program uh, that's you know fully accessible or universal, uh, so to speak, is that we can provide that service to everyone in the province who wants to partake in it. During COVID-19, in the very first wave, so in the spring of 2020, uh, we did uh, defer that because the schools were closed, so there was no audience in which to give vaccines. Um, but we did run a, a summer catch-up clinic to get those students back on track with their immunizations, and we were able to preserve that school immunization program throughout the rest of the, um, throughout the, rest of the pandemic. MLA White. And my next question is for you as well. well there it is. My next question is for you as well, Ms. DeSantis. It, I know it seems kind of obvious, but your work is extremely broad, as you've explained today. But can you tell us what effects COVID has had on the work of public health and the impact you see going forward? Ms. DeSantis. So in the uh, earlier days of the pandemic, um, all of our uh, all of our complement, all of our staff were redeployed and reassigned to focus on the COVID pandemic. And in fact, we worked uh, across the health system and and even uh, through government. We had staff come and support some of the work we did uh, throughout the pandemic. Uh, throughout the pandemic, now we've uh, established uh, interim <coughs> teams with the COVID funding that we're receiving to hold that work, which has allowed us to uh, reassign our staff back to their core programs and services, um, meaning that we've stepped back into those areas uh, that were deferred during COVID and restarted those programs and services. I would say that, you know, it, it was not an easy time for our staff. Um, it was very demanding. It was an ever-evolving situation. And uh, we worked very closely uh, in the health authority with many of our partners uh, to redesign, you know, pathways to care and models of service delivery. Um, and our other programs and services that were deferred, um, you know, we're now restarting and actively sort of recovering our staff and restarting those programs. 
MLA White, 145 remaining. 145, okay. Uh, I have a question here for you again, Mr. Santos. I'm wondering if you can expand a little bit further on what the early years and healthy communities investment consist of. Ms. DeSantis. Maybe because we're short on time, I'll focus on one particular area. Um, with the early years, I think we've talked a fair bit about it, but with our healthy communities investment, we are looking to expand our youth health center uh, services and support. So part of our enhanced uh, capacity funding um, includes additional resources to move into more uh, youth health centers across the province. Uh, that uh, work is done um, under a health promoting schools approach. So it addresses a lot of the issues we've talked about today in terms of, you know, injury, uh, physical activity, food, access to uh, he healthy, safe, affordable food uh, in our school programs. And so um, that that investment will actually grow that program to areas of the province which hadn't, haven't previously had that service. MLA White, 37. 37 seconds. <laughs> well, I, I won't have a question for you, but I, I do want to explain or express uh, my gratitude for the panel coming in today. Uh, if anything, you've broadened our knowledge on the broad work that you cover. Uh, when you think of health, we just think of, I'm sick, I'm going to the hospital. But what you folks are doing is absolutely amazing. It's, I don't know how you keep your head around it, to be honest with you. So thank you very much for doing what you do. <laughs> thank you, Emily White. Uh, at this point in time, the question and answer period is over. I will offer the floor for any of our, our panelists and witnesses who have closing remarks. Dr. Strang. So thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, thank you to my colleagues from Dalhousie for, for, for joining us and maybe I'll just uh, build on uh, MLA White's comments because we use the phrase we need to talk about health in all its broad dimensions, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual health and all the factors that ultimately contribute to health, not just about health care. And I think that's the key point we'd like to leave you with, that investing in public health so we have the appropriate resources and capacity to fulfill our role, as well as investing in a broad range of initiatives that some have been touched on today that are outside the healthcare system that impact the health of the public is fundamentally necessary to create a sustainable publicly funded healthcare system. We need to tur turn down the demand tap um, and public health is, needs to be positioned and resourced to be a leader in those conversations broad, multi-sectoral, multi-departmental conversations about decreasing the demand for health care, that, that we fundamentally need it's both parts, transforming the health care system and investing in health. Uh, we are, we will be investing in year three and in uh, fiscal year 23-24 of, of an investment in public health. And I see that the way moving forward from there is the solution six of, tr of, uh, of action for health gives the opportunity for, for public health to work uh, with other de uh, departments. And I would argue every government department has a role in some way, shape or form in, in improving the, or impacting the health of the public. So that cross-departmental, cross-sectoral work that we will be engaging in under Solution 6 will identify specific areas for action and investment, both in terms of public health capacity and broader in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, initiatives that will improve the health of the public. And I will end with just saying, I gave a few examples. This, the, the impacts of this aren't all long-term. They can be short term as well. And uh, the one example that I didn't give earlier was that uh, we know that uh, when we made uh, uh, indoor places uh, smoke free, the, the research very quickly showed that the, doing that sub significantly decreased the risk of, or the, the rate of heart attacks, that people with heart attacks that were appearing in emergency rooms. So that is one example of a health promotion approach which actually can have uh, fairly immediate impacts on health care utilization. So it is both short term and long term, these investments. But thank you for the opportunity today. Thank you, Dr. Strang. If anyone else has any brief closing remarks, uh, in the interest of time, we'd like to uh, keep them brief, please, and thank you. Uh, we'll go to Dr. Fer Ferlbeck first and then Dr. Kirk. Thanks. Do
so public health funding historically is, is, is linked fairly directly to crises from the 2003 SARS pandemic to Walkerton to H1N1 funding is often channeled to public health when people are scared. But when the crisis is gone, there is a paradox in public health funding, which is that the better that public health functions and getting things working well, the more likely they are to lose the funding to more immediate healthcare issues, largely because of political pressures. So please don't forget about public health, even when the crisis settles down. If, if you ignore what's happening at the upstream, upstream end of things, you're always going to be desperately trying to put up fires at the downstream end. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Kirk? Thank you. I will be brief. Um, I just want to, to follow on from a point that, um, that my colleague, Ms. DeSantis, <coughs> talked about, which was around health promoting schools, um, and leave you with a good news story, because we have been working um, in schools across the province um, with a focus actually in rural communities, um, and actually Emily Maguire might even remember the funding that we received back in 2019 to do work to engage youth, students and youth in um, promoting um, and enhancing their school environments, um, and we are getting some great outcomes from that. I would love to talk to you all about it um, in a different venue, um, but uh, are you Youth have a, a huge role in, in actually addressing some of the issues that we're facing in our healthcare system. Thank you, Dr. Kirk. And on behalf of the committee, thank you to all the witnesses for appearing today, and thank you for the good work that you do keeping Nova Scotians safe and healthy. You're now free to go, and I would suggest that we take a 60-second recess just to allow the witnesses to gather their belongings and, and head out. Order. I've reconvened this meeting on the Health Standing Committee. I recognize MLA Burrell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that the hour of meeting be extended in order to accommodate dealing with the entire agenda, including the NDP motion under any other business. There is a motion on the floor to extend the meeting. Yes. All those in favor signify by saying, oh, any discussion? Pardon me. Any discussion on the motion? Emily Palmer. Thanks, Chair. I, I have to respectfully say that um, I would be opposed to that today. Uh, a lot of us on this side of the table are rural MLAs. I know myself, I've been here for three days on different committees, and uh, I have meetings in my constituency that I have to be back for, and I scheduled it to be out of uh, on time for our meeting today. And uh, being gone on my constituency for three days, I feel it's important for me to be back for my, my meetings. So I have to respectfully say that I will not be supporting that. Thank you, MLA Palmer. There is a motion on the floor. Any further discussion? 
Motion to extend. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Nay. The motion is defeated. Uh, I vote no to an extension. Committee business number one, January 16th, 2023, letter to the chair from MLA's LeBlanc and Borough requesting additions to the January 19th meeting witness list. The results of the email poll did not lead to a unanimous decision. Is there any discussion on the correspondence? Hearing none, we'll put a check mark beside that. Item number two, January 17th, 2023, email to the chair from MLA Smith McCrossan requesting an urgent meeting. Any discussion on that? Emily? Uh, seeing no discussion on that correspondence, we will move on. January 2017, 2023, email to the chair from the Liberal Caucus stating MLA McGuire's intent to make a motion at today's meeting. Any discussion on the motion? MLA McGuire. I'm just going to put the motion on the floor, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, do the ongoing issues, no discussion facing with access to emergency care in this province. The Liberal Caucus is making a motion to call an emergency meeting with the topic being access to emergency care with the following witnesses. One, Karen Ophiel, CEO and President of the Nova Scotia Health Authority. Jeannie Lagasse, uh, Deputy Minister of Health and Wellness. Dr. Kirk McGee, Department Head and, NS and NSHA Central Zone Chief. Charles Keating, Emergency and Trauma Center. Dr. Andrew Link, Chair and Chief uh, Pediatrics at the IWK Health Center. Uh, we want this meeting to take place as soon as possible and happen within seven days of the motion being passed. Thank you. MLA McGuire, any discussion on the motion? MLA Palmer. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, respectfully, I mean, the, the, the idea behind an emergency meeting, it's very, very uh, apparent. Some of the, uh, the things that have happened uh, at different spots in Nova Scotia, uh, to, we are in a crisis. We are in an emergency. Uh, to suggest that it's just just happening recently, um, you know, newsflash: we've been in an emergency healthcare crisis for a long time. Um, some of us have recognized it, and we're acting on it. Um, just this week, yesterday, the uh, the health minister and the CEO of NSH had a, uh, a press conference, and they spoke to a million Nova Scotians, outlining the plan for emergency uh, revitalization and what we're going to do. Uh, so the need to have them appear before this committee, uh, I don't believe they're just going to tell us the same thing. I mean, but I'd, I guess I'd recommend uh, to maybe my my, mem my friend opposite that uh, maybe a better use of the committee might be to um, maybe at a topic selection for another agenda setting meeting to uh, put a, a topic out that would be uh, an evaluation of the plan being put forward by the government, by the minister uh, yesterday. Uh, they're meeting with uh, constituents and, and uh, people all over the province, uh, very transparent, and they are uh, addressing the urgency of it and uh, in communities one end of the province to another. So um, I would just say that, uh, you know, there would, would be more use of the committee and we, we might even bring it up as a topic to do an evaluation of the uh, plan being put in place right now. So um, I would say that uh, this side of the table would be opposed to an emergency meeting. Thank you, MLA Palmer. Any further discussion on the motion? Then we will call the question. Any... There's been a request for a recorded vote. I will ask the clerk to record the votes. Ms. Sheehy Richard? No. Mr. Palmer? No. Mr. White? No. Ms. Barkhouse? No. Mr. McGuire? Absolutely yes. Ms. DiCostanzo? Yes. Mr. Burrell? Yes. Ms. LeBlanc? Yes. And Mr. Smith? No. That's five no's, four yeses. The results of the vote are five no's, four yeses. That motion is defeated. Moving on, I believe. Uh, MLA LeBlanc. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, um, I believe the clerk has uh, circulated a motion that we would like to table um, right now. Uh, uh, people across the province are concerned about their ability to access emergency care. This is a years-long crisis, as our colleague has just said, and uh, it has seen renewed urgency since the tragic deaths of Alison Holtoff and Charlene Snow. The NSGEU uh, represents staff at the Halifax Infirmary, many of whom are at their wits' end, and they came together and assembled a list of 59 straight forward suggestions to improve emergency care at the Halifax Infirmary. Some of the suggestions are as simple as replacing the payphone in the waiting room with a free phone that people can use to call their family while they're waiting for you know many, many eight hours, sometimes more than eight, uh, or make sure that there's food available at all hours. Others are also simple and would make a di big difference in the recruitment crisis, like covering nurses' parking and, and providing retention bonuses. But unfortunately, the government has yet to respond to this very well thought out and very specific letter. So my motion is this. I move that the committee write to the Department of Health and Wellness in support of the staff at the Halifax Infirmary and ask that the department please provide a written response as soon as possible. So, Mr. Chair, this is a very simple motion. I, I believe it is our job as the Health Committee, as Legislative Health Committee, to uh, respond to such uh, you know, pieces of writing and, and suggestions that, that come forward in the public. And so I ask the whole committee's support of this motion. All we're doing is asking the department to re provide a written res response. Thank you. Thank you, MLA LeBlanc. MLA McGuire, is your discussion on this motion? Please turn on my mic. So, uh, Mr. MLA Chair. MLA McGuire. Mr. Chair. Please don't speak that way to me. MLA McGuire. I, I, turn I, my I mic recognize on. MLA McGuire. I asked you to turn my mic on so I could speak. So, there's two motions that have been put forward at this committee. I didn't get a chance to respond to the vote, even though my hand was up. What I will say is this, what was said yesterday in public by Karen Oldfield and this government was a plan that had no, I, no, this, I, that had no chance of recruitment. So we are going to support. Order. We are going to support the NDPs. I would like to keep the discussion the on the motion that is on the well, floor. Give me a chance to respond. If you there is discussion ignore, on the motion that is on the floor, chair, MLA White. My hand being put up to have a discussion. Thank you, Chair. Your job is not to, to ignore So to the NDP members, caucus who are listening while this meeting is actually in order. To the members and allow the members to order, respond. please. You chose to, just wait, you chose to ignore my arm. I recognize I MLA White. I have a right to speak Thank in this chair. committee, and just because you don't want to hear what I have to say, doesn't mean I, rec I recognize me. MLA White. Nova on the so to the NDP caucus, we we value the letter you put forward, the motion. We do. What I have to say is that I am concerned that the letter, who the letter was addressed to, and that the Department of Health was not just CC'd on the letter. I also so I don't know if you can clarify that today or not, but what I would say to you is that I would support a motion with an amendment. And it would read this, that the committee write to the Department of Health and Wellness and ask that the department please provide a written response to the letter sent by the NSGU listing 59 suggestions to improve emergency care at the Halifax Infirmary as soon as possible. To clarify, the difference is that it's not in support of, because I... Personally, I do not know what the 59 recommendations are. I value their opinion, absolutely. They're frontline workers, we do. But we can't support something we don't know. So if you guys, would, if you folks would support that amendment, we would vote in favor of it. Or, order, we will vote on the amendment proposed by MLA White. All those in favor of the amendment? Aye. Aye. That motion is, the amendment motion is carried. On the original motion to write the letter, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any contrary? That motion is carried as well. Any additional business? Then I will note that the next scheduled meeting for this health committee is Tuesday, February 14th, 2023 from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m with the topic being the delivery of the 4.1 hours of care per resident in long-term care. Witnesses shall be the Department of Seniors and Long-Term Care, Office of Healthcare Professionals Recruitment, Nova Scotia Nurses Union, and CUPE Nova Scotia. Did you say one, three, or two, four? 
one to three. If there is no other business, MLA McGuire. So I want to go back to uh, what just happened here. Um, I, a, I had put a motion on the floor, and the motion was voted down by the Conservative government, and, and I was not given an opportunity to respond. The chair took, I, just wait, well, then you don't have to listen. The chair, the chair took it upon himself to ignore me as a member of this committee. I have a right to be in this committee, I have a right to, res to speak, and I have a right to respond to a motion I put on the floor. So I just want to say that the way this committee is being run, allowing, uh, allowing um, individuals to have a half hour to speak, biting into the time that we have to ask questions, um, to, to, to not allow extensions. Every single time we were in this committee, where we, the government votes down extensions uh, to allow us to continue to sit here and, and deal with committee business. And then now, um, an elected person who's been on this committee, who was elected by the people of their community to be a voice and has questions about a very important subject and topic, was completely ignored. The, the chair did not even look in my direction and then said, oh, order, I'm not, no, I'm not finished speaking. I have the right to speak. You can't. I, I understand you have the right to speak. The criticisms that you're offering are, are unfair, in my view. If you, have an, if you have criticism over the chairing, the appeal process is to write to the speaker and, and appeal any decisions that are made in committees. So feel free to take that option. I'd like to continue. You interrupt. I recognize MLA White. Thank you, Chair. A good chair at that. Since we're talking about management of this meeting, I would like to recommend that when somebody's recognized to speak and that mic is on, that the rest of the committee members stop Bingo. and let me speak. My mic is on right now. Thank you very much. Because the chair has recognized me, and if we're going to have a functioning group and a committee that's working, mistakes happen. If the chair has missed you, that's a mistake. If that's what happened, so be it. That does not give you the right to disrespect oh. the chair or myself, who's also an elected official, oh, to sit here and speak. Thank you, MLA White. I apologize to MLA Barcos. I offer you the floor. I'd like to make one statement. Um, MLA McGuire, as you could tell from earlier, because I'm sitting here watching the whole thing, our chair does not have to look you directly in the eyes. I was watching uh, MLA Le 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 sorry, LeBlanc uh, rose her hand first. Um, our chair and no chair can read minds. Uh, we are not aware, I am sure, that she was going to put her motion forward. Um, and I, I think it's just totally inappropriate to go on like this. It's just political sound bites, and there's absolutely no need for it. Order. This meeting stand adjourned. <laughs>